In vast countries, the inundations caused by the overflow of mighty rivers have often worked enormous destruction to life and property. Because of such periodical devastation, these great floods in those lands subject to them have been called dragons. In Roman mythology, the monster serpent Python, hatched from the mud of a deluge, was slain near Delphi by Apollo, that is, by the sun god, who of course dries up all floods. Perhaps again, it was the winding course of certain rivers peculiarly liable to flood and overflow, resembling, when viewed from a high position, the twinings and twistings of a mighty serpent coiled along the land, which first gave rise to the idea of their being regarded as devouring, devastating dragons. In Bithynia, in Asia Minor, there is a river with numerous windings which is called Draco, apparently from some connection with this notion. In Italy and in Germany are found rivers deriving similar names from the same cause, while in Switzerland the name Drac is given to a number of rushing mountain torrents which, suddenly breaking out, descend like avalanches on the lower country. While in Christian legend, the vile enemy overcome by the human hero generally stands for some overwhelming danger to man, either spiritual or material, in pagan mythology, the idea presented is emblematical of the victory of spring over winter, of light over darkness, or of the ultimate prevalence of some other beneficent physical phenomenon. The introduction of the device of St George and the Dragon on the English coinage after the victory of Waterloo was intended to symbolise the overthrow of French militarism. In the Vedas, or sacred books of the Hindus, mention is made of the Dragon Ahi, understood to be the throttling snake of darkness, and of Sasha the wicked serpent whose baleful influence leads to storms and the strife of the elements in thunder, lightning and tempest, from which, ultimately, the fructification of the land is effected. They churn the ocean to produce the drink of the gods, which, of course, is the fertilising rain. Other monsters influence the midsummer sun, which parches the soil and burns up the vegetation. To some association with the latter may possibly be traced the origin of the old English custom of celebrating Midsummer Eve with bonfires. Many Dwagon superstitions had their origin in ancient systems of astronomy. By the ancient Greeks, the solstices were called the head and tail of the Dwagon. Similarly, the Hindus identified the nodes of the moon as the head and tail of the Dwagon the beginning and end of astronomical periods. When an eclipse is visible in the Far East, the Chinese, the natives of Sumatra and others set about making a great noise with sounding instruments, purposing by this horrible din to frighten away the dragon, otherwise to prevent one luminary from devouring the other. Not a few Dragon legends pretend to account for certain striking physical features of the locality in which they have originated. The more ancient myths of the East seek to explain meteorological phenomena by attributing them to dragon influences. Thus, the lightnings are flying fiery serpents, the equinoctial gales and the menacing spring tides are caused by the awakening of some potent cave dragon, and so on. The old alchemists, too, had their system of dragon law. The most powerful of medicaments were yielded by dragons. One deadly dragon that lived within the deepest gloom of the forest, and which no basilisk could equal, had no want of poison when he saw the sun or fire he spit bat out venom while flying, of which no living creature could be cured. From his poison physic is produced, which he entirely consumes, and eats his own venomous tail. This must be accomplished by him in order to produce the noblest balm. A possible interpretation is the conversion in the operations of nature, 
of excessive heat into fertility. Heat is life. The serpent has long been used as the emblem of life and healing. Did not Moses lift up the figure of a brazen serpent in the wilderness to heal the stricken Israelites? Concerning the dietary of dragons, we know from the detailed incidents of a number of legends that their favourite food would appear to be the flesh of young, beautiful and innocent virgins. As to their favourite beverage, we have but one authority, that of the old Elizabethan writer Edward Topsall, who in one of those quaint works known as a bestiary, which purports to describe the true and lively figure of every four-footed beast that walketh upon the earth. It is mentioned, under the zoology of the elephant, that this great pachyderm possesses the coldest blood in the world, and that dragons, in the scorching heat of summer, cannot get anything to cool them except this blood 